Hello and welcome back to Critical Thinking. And this week we're going to look at logical fallacies. So module five, logical fallacies and as much as possible trying to avoid them. But first we need to identify what they are. So that's essentially what we're going to do in this, uh, this particular set of uh, slides. Uh, look at what those fallacies are, how they work, both for and against our arguments. And I pointed out last week and have been throughout this whole course that when we talk about argumentation, we're not talking about people yelling at each other, trying to convince them that uh, their point of view is a correct one. We want to do that, but in a much more subtle way. We wish to persuade those people. So formal argumentation, this would be a written argument, for example, that uses logic and reason and some rhetorical devices. Uh, they differ from everyday arguments that you might have with your friends, uh, family members, and so on. And they differ in the following ways. Kind of three sort of general categories. Um, there is a notion of deliberation, right? Uh, lawyers will, for example, argue and deliberate over evidence. Even though evidence may be factual, it is the interpretation of that evidence, uh, what that evidence mean, means in the larger picture, for example. But there is a degree of deliberation using language between lawyers about facts. So that's one. The other one that we probably see more so of than anything else is advertisers that do the proverbial compare and contrast. Uh, this product, you know, detergent, car, whatever, is better than product X. So it's a comparison and a contrast between one product over against another. And of course, the advertiser is going to praise their product over the other because that's simply what advertising does. So there is a degree of deliberateness in that as well. And then finally, the third one, which is more likely what you're going to experience in a classroom setting or work setting, is simply to try to convince someone, right? Uh, you can be convincing uh, your boss for a raise. You can try to convince a coworker uh, or an underling, a subordinate to do a particular task. Now, they're gonna have to do it anyway because you're their boss. But to point out an effective way or an efficient way to do something still requires some kind of argumentation because you're not trying to insult a person, you're trying to help them, but you want to be able to come off as someone that is persuading another person to do a good job. And if you present it in that way, the more likely they listen to you. So we talked about uh, argumentation. So here is a, a pretty good sort of working definition of what an argument is. It is communication in which the writer or speaker takes a stand on an issue, decides that X or Y is going to be the right thing to do, while providing proof and evidence of that stand's validity and importance with the goal of persuasion. So there's several things going on here. First of all, it is a form of communication, clearly. It is also the communication of someone taking a particular stand on an issue. And it doesn't have to be political, it can be about literally anything. Um, what you do then after that is provide facts, evidence, proof that that stand is valid. It's the right one. And so using the proof and the evidence, you then point out the validity of the stand that you're taking, its importance as being the better one. And all of this is lovingly deep fried in a goal of persuasion, we'll say, so that all of it is done to persuade the person who was listening. And that ultimately is what you want to do. So uh, you have to also be aware of the other side, uh, whether you concede a point or whether you at least find some sort of common ground of agreement. Uh, if you remember last week, one of the questions I asked you, you know, which argument seems to have the most likely uh, degree of success? And the answer was C. Even if there was a uh, disagreement with the other person's point of view, they can see that point of view. They can concede that it exists. Why is that important? Because it becomes a stepping stone to the, to the argument continuing. So you have to be aware of the other side. Otherwise, your argument is unethical, right? It's not bordering on immoral, but it's unethical because you're not considering what the other side is trying to tell you. So argumentation is the explanation of cause and effect relationships. If you do the following in this way, you will do it more efficiently versus some other way. Or if we follow this particular procedure, if we vote for this particular uh, you know, law or whatever, things will be better. So there is a causal uh, relationship, a cause and effect relationship between the position or the stand that's taken and a hopeful betterment of 
whether it's society or whether it's just the workplace. But there is a cause and effect relationship that needs to be outlined. Now, there's also an attempt to overturn assumed knowledge in favor of a new idea, a new way of doing things, a new perspective, a new worldview, any number of these things, uh, or simply a solution to an existing problem. So all of those, as you can imagine, are things that you're going to experience in the everyday world, whether it's family and friends, at school, at work, uh, because there are always causal relationships between things. Uh, there is usually assumed knowledge. Uh, you know, we've been doing this for years is typically what a person will say. Well, you know, you could do it differently. You can do it better. You can do it more efficiently, these kinds of things. So those are typically the situations that you'll find yourself when you're having an argument with someone. We call it a discussion, but it is still an argument because you are presenting a particular stand and you're supporting that stand with facts and opinions. Okay. So if you don't have any kind of variable, verifiable facts, scientific or otherwise, it becomes kind of difficult for someone to accept your position unless they already agree with it, at which point it's not, it's no longer an argument. It's simply a conversation. So for that argument to work, for it to be taken seriously, it needs to have those verifiable facts. And again, whether or not they are scientific, uh, remember science is not, is not exact nor is it always the gospel truth. These are always hypotheses that are presented. At the present time, we know this. For example, living on Mars, uh, there are some people who believe that this is, this is feasible, right? This is doable. We have a long way to go, but there are some individuals who think that there is the potential to live on Mars, not life on Mars necessarily, but to live on Mars. That's a tall order, but we have to have verifiable facts to present to to, uh, for example, in the U.S., right, when NASA needs uh, funding money, tax money, there has to be a legitimate reason why we would even spend the kinds of billions and trillions of dollars that would go into something like a settlement on Mars. We need to make sure that, you know, is this thing doable? Are we not wasting our time? That would be a huge argument that would need to be constructed carefully and with a great degree of persuasion and plausibility. It would need to be plausible through all of the facts that are presented. So ultimately, you see what I'm, what I'm talking about here. Whatever idea you have, whatever stand you take, you have to be able to back it up. So a sound argument has, a, has at its roots a series of provable assertions, uh, facts, and evidence of some sort. Because if it doesn't, then that argument is not the strongest, uh, the strongest foundation upon which to stand when you're trying to argue and persuade someone else. Now, one thing we need to be careful of is making that distinction between what actually constitutes an argument. Uh, because I've talked about this in both this class and in ethics, uh, some of the outlandish ideas that certain individuals have south of the border, and let's face it, quite a few people in Canada, about a whole range of things. One week, everybody is a virologist. Uh, the next week, they're constitutional experts. And the week after that, they're immigration experts. Who knows? But it's all based really at the end of the day on opinion. So let's break down what actually constitutes a good argument. And we're going to work from bottom up here. Each one of us has opinions, right? So these are subjective beliefs. These are typically value judgments that people make. And those opinions, because they are such, may or may not be supported by verifiable facts. So most people present opinions as if they were facts. You know, the proverbial, well, everybody says, well, who's everybody? Scientists, your friends, the baker down the street. So it's an opinion. It's a subjective belief. And people do have them. So we talk about opinions when these ideas, these beliefs and judgments are typically not supported by verifiable facts. They think they are, those individuals that talk about them, but realize if you really think about it, it's simply sort of common knowledge or common thought or the thoughts of a particular group of people that you wish to be associated with. Ultimately though, an opinion is just that, a subjective belief or a value judgment. Uh, they're often very quick uh, generalizations, so everybody does this, and absolutely be careful of those words, and we're going to get to that. So the worst kind of argumentation is strictly just basing it on opinion. 
That's, that's where you don't want to go. The second one is slightly better, and that would be an inference. Now, this is what's called an informed interpretation, right? You have an interpretation of, of events. Uh, you have an idea about them, a hypothesis of some sort that is based to some degree on established facts. But really, when you listen to it and you think about it, it has the appearance of truth, but it could also be based on faulty reasoning. It could be based on irrational conclusions. So what's happening here is you're, you're doing some research, we'll say. You're finding out some kind of information that you don't question to any sort of critical degree. You simply accept it as an established fact. So you infer an idea. So it's not as bad as opinion because there, there are no verifiable facts. It's just a belief based on whatever. An inference is slightly better because it may be uh, based on established facts, but those facts may not have necessarily been tested. The best way to go about building an argument is by using facts. Facts as we know them at this particular time. Now remember, scientific facts are not etched in stone. They never have been and they never will be. It is our, our best understanding of something at a given time. And if you don't believe me, take a look at how wacky some ideas used to be only a few hundred years ago. Uh, the church believed uh, during the Renaissance that the earth was stable and was the center of the universe and everything else rotated around it. We have since changed our mind. Uh, the jury's still out on the Flat Earth Society, so let's leave that one alone. But it, it is implied that some people are absolutely convinced that the earth is flat. So... Is it an opinion? To them, it isn't. See, that's the difference. Those people who believe that the Earth is flat, or at one point thought that the Earth was at the center of the universe, truly believed it. So that's really ultimately an inference, right? It's kind of established knowledge, but knowledge that has not been tested in, to any great degree. Ultimately, the best way to go and build an argument is with facts. So some kind of truth claim that you can prove Right? It can be verified to a pretty high degree of certainty, at least with the gear that we've got, you know, whether it's a telescope, a microscope, or whatever. Um, if you can test it and you can prove conclusively the same results will occur over and over again, that's a pretty strong fact, at least at this point in time. So uh, whether it's, you know, based on the laws of nature, causal relationships, scientific experimentation, or whatever, uh, it can be historical trends, right? If you're talking about politics or other things. So as much as possible, always base your argument on facts and the best facts that are available, verifiable and testable facts. And if they have been already tested, all the better. Okay, when you are going to create an argument, now typically uh, in the work that you do in fire prevention, fire safety, you're writing perhaps case studies, uh, you wrote a couple of essays for me last term in ethics, and there I asked you to use some degree of argumentation because I wanted to see, first of all, the other side presented. No matter what you discussed, I always stressed, you know, you've got to present the other side's argument first because then it does two things. It shows that you are willing to listen to the other side, and possibly concede a point. Some of you did sometimes and were not 100% sure. That's perfectly fine but you, you acknowledged the other side. That's important. So when you have all this information, you want to organize that information in such a way that, and this is entirely up to you. It depends on the position you want, you wish to take and how you wish to present it. There are ways in which you could organize your argument so that the most important point or points are saved until the end. Now that tends to be a pretty strong way to argue why because the reader or listener is going to finish with those last thoughts in mind. And if you can do that, save the best for last. So build up your argument. Typically, you would think, you know, put the most important one at the beginning and then work your way down. That is good if you write for a newspaper, if that's even a thing anymore. I'm not sure. But when I used to write for a newspaper, uh, the most important information was always, always at the very top. So let's say there was a column that the, uh, the the editor would set up. Always the most important information at the beginning of the article. Why? Because if it came time to edit uh, some portion of my article, they would always cut from the bottom. 
then that way it would fit uh, into the column space and the column length on the page. And that way, I still presented the most important information right off the bat. Because when people are leafing through newspapers, they tend to read the first two or three paragraphs anyway. And that's where you want to have the most important points. When you are building an argument, and that's a different thing altogether in an essay, usually the best strategy is to present that information at the tail end. The very last thing the reader will think about is your strongest point. So it is a very effective way to argue. Now, along the way, as I mentioned in the ethics uh, course, you wish to concede points. And that means you are allowing the opponent's point some some recognition and some degree of merit. It could be that the other side will say, you know, uh, has opened up a certain uh, conundrum, some sort of, uh, you know, uh, dead end in an argument that is important. It needs, we need to overcome this particular block, this obstacle that we have. Uh, and it could be an obstacle towards um, some, some kind of consensus. So you concede the point by saying that the, the opponent has presented and raised this point that, you know, if we can overcome this, we could have better agreement. So if you are doing this, you can do one of two things. You can use that and at least identify it and uh, allow it to be an opposing point. But you can also come back with it with a more substantial counter argument. Um, those who believe in X say this. Well, those who believe in Y acknowledge X, but counter it with this. So you're doing two things. You're being fair and ethical by hearing the other side. But now your argument is made that much stronger by acknowledging what you would be, uh, what you would consider a deficiency in the other side. So that is always important. So conceding a point is important because you're at least identifying that there is even an other side that exists. So a, th a thoughtful and thorough argument will indicate that proof by considering all sides of the debate. So if you do that, your side, if you do, if you write a really good argument, your side comes off as the better of the two because you have acknowledged the limitations of that other side, that, that other point of view. And by doing that, you're able to come to the point that you wish to discuss, typically at the end of the essay, and you end up being able to rally together these different ideas, both for and against your position. But even those against are dealt with and responded to in a really effective manner. And your response is your main point. So it works it actually work very well. Now, other ways to go about it is to ask rhetorical questions. You want to try to be persuasive by emphasizing your position. Uh, you want to point out an error in the, the, the other side's argument. Um, when you do that, you're asking a rhetorical question. And it's rhetorical because it's kind of not meant to be answered directly, you know, a yes or no answer. But what you want to do is the body of the essay, the body of the argument is in fact, is in fact an answer to that rhetorical question. You're probably wondering what is a, a sink full of dirty water there for? Well, that's going to come from, uh, it was an article on the water crisis in Flint, Michigan that started in 2014 and wasn't resolved until the late 2019. So for, for five years, the, um, the basically the, the citizens of Flint, Michigan had this dirty, gross, stinky water that was coming out of their taps and they went to court over and over and over again to get this resolved so let's say you started your argument with well would you want to uh, drink out of the taps from uh, from flint michigan well of course the answer is no and then you build your argument in favor of the systematic racism and or systematic classicism that has been basically causing this problem and perpetuating the problem so you ask the rhetorical question, do you want to drink out of that tap water? No, the answer is no. Well, then, would you want to live in Flint, Michigan? Well, not if that's what it looks like. Then you begin your argument saying, you know, here's why we're in this position. So it is a rhetorical question, but the answer to that question is the body of the argument. Now, if you were to try to map it out, if you are kind of a visual person and you are thinking of all the various aspects of that argument and how they work, as you can see, first of all, lots of arrows pointing in all different kinds of ways, but ultimately you're persuading in, and influencing someone to change their mind, right? You're persuading someone and, you're, and for yourself, you're developing that line of, a line of reasoned argument. You're backing up that argument with points, using language, using logic, using reason, 
You're establishing the positive aspects of your arguments, wh why your argument is the right one. And of course, you get your point across in a fairly calm and assertive manner. You don't start screaming at people. And this was another question I, I had you consider last week. Uh, how do we identify when you know people think that you're having an argument with them when you're just simply discussing the tone of voice, right? The body language, the body gestures, the sort of the kind of jab, jabbing aggressive tendency that people have with their fingers and you know tilting in towards you. Um, that's not calm and assertive at all. So ultimately, all of these issues have to uh, kind of revolve around this notion of influencing because that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to influence and persuade others to move towards your your point of view. So you do it in a calm and assertive manner. You're tactful. You don't try to manipulate them in any way or worse, coerce them. You want to persuade them. Uh, you can also negotiate. And if you negotiate, that's when you are uh, uh, at least addressing the other side, right? You're not saying it's my way, the doorway. You're saying, well, look, other people have these positions. Let's take a look at it. And so once you do, you point out the deficiencies or the shortcomings of the other position in order to strengthen your own. So ultimately, it works actually, actually quite well because it sounds at the very least fair, right? That you've, you've thought about the other side. So if you are writing an argument, writing an essay that is argumentative, you want to make sure that you are at least aware of some of these different strategies. So uh, what we're going to look at shortly is some of the uh, rhetorical devices that we can use and let's we're going to identify them sort of carefully because they are they can be used it's not like they're unethical but we need to be able to identify them in an other person's argument so if we can see the, uh, what is going on what's what's at work here then we can sort of break it down and say well really this this argument is an appeal to the emotions you know it's an appeal to to uh, to uh, some kind of authority figure without questioning and, and, be, and being critical of it. But let's have a look at this because when you are thinking as a, as a writer and then also, uh, you know, as a reader later on, because you're reading other people's material, you want to be able to think about these things as you then turn around and start drafting and revising your, your uh, argumentative essay. Okay. So when we are thinking about a kind of argumentative essay, and again, this can just be a discussion uh, rather than an essay, it's going to be a conversation, a dialogue, right? Uh, between at least two people. So you should consider the following, the language of the argumentation. You want to be able to use it in clear, concise language. If you're speaking to someone that is not an expert in the field of fire prevention and fire safety, you may need to define certain terms and and have them understand what you're talking about, because without that, they're going to kind of just, you know, tune out and glaze over and not know what you're talking about. So the language of the argumentation is important Two, the support that you provide to that essay's claims, right? Those verifiable facts. Now, as much as possible, refrain from using these logical fallacies uh, because others might use them and hope that they're not going to get caught. But as much as possible, try to refrain from them. And again, we're going to look at them in detail. And then finally, and this has a lot to do with the first one, the, the notion of language, is number four, your audience and your purpose. If the purpose of a case study or let's say a report that you're going to hand in to an insurance company, uh, you need to be very clear on when you define the cause of a fire, that you can prove that with facts, verifiable facts, because that claim could possibly, possibly lead to, um, to a charge of arson against someone, or at least um, the insurance company looking at your report and saying, well, you know, funny, we contacted these people several times and we mentioned, um, let's say, you know, uh, uh, fire extinguishers and sprinklers and fire alarms and, you know, fire detectors and so on. And you are telling me that we, they never put any of those in? Oh, okay, well, thank you, because now we're going to turn down their claim because we warned them and they never followed through. So yeah, your audience and the purpose of your document is very important. So when you are writing, you need to consider that. So you are writing with as few rhetorical, you know, logical fallacies as possible. Always straightforward. Now, surprisingly enough, Aristotle, writing in the fourth century, like 360 something BC, uh, 
presented to us these different rhetorical devices that guess what are still around because he got it right <laughs> he really did the first time around and these particular particular devices uh, are designed to persuade an audience and so I want to take a look at these because your uh, your in-class assignment hopefully it's going to be kind of fun it shouldn't be that hard is to identify some of these different ones so there is the first one which is logos logos which is greek for reason and this is one of the ways in which you can remember it because logos it means re reason it means speech that is an appeal to logic or to common sense so a rhetorical device or at least the identity of it being logos means reasoning and formal logic can sometimes be used to form a persuasive foundation upon which to build an effective argument so what that means is appealing to logos appealing to science to reason to logic to common sense allows you to build and construct a solid argument so an argument based on logos is actually a, typically a very good one because the found the persuasive foundation the way in which you persuade someone is using logic so it's kind of hard to knock that down compared to some of the other ones now here's an example and we're going to sort of look at the same statement three different ways so if i'm going to make that statement here it's minus 30 degrees outside dress warmly or you'll freeze to death i'm using common sense i'm using logic and i'm also using some degree of science because i know that minus 30 if you spend enough time outside you will freeze to death so it's based on logos i'm also persuading you like please dress warmly because it's damn cold out there but i finish it with or you'll freeze to death that's a scientific fact and it uses logic to persuade you to to dress warmly now the second one now this is one that can be uh open to manipulation and it typically is so the first one uh, aristotle being a philosopher uh, and uh, biologists and so on really thought that the strongest argument are arguments based on logos but he ident identified two others one of those two is this one pathos so think of the word pathetic right or pathos in terms of a story a sad story could be a happy story but what it is it's an appeal to the emotions so we know that individuals tend to respond much more strongly to emotional appeals whether it's a personal need or value then the formal logic and what that means is in advertising for example the appeal to to emotions is is basically it's checking off the boxes right it's pushing those buttons that whether it's images of sexuality wealth and power youth uh, advertisers continually use these images to convey to us manipulating our emotions that product x or y will uh you know get you more friends or get you uh better significant you know partners or whatever it doesn't matter it's an appeal to the emotions so again let's consider the statement that i just showed you from before it's minus 30 degrees outside be a true canadian and wear a toque to keep warm hmm okay so i've appealed to some part of your of your personality that if you're proud to be Canadian, you're going to go, well, yeah, okay, sure. And on goes the two, and out the doors you, you go. So I made an emotional appeal. Yes, I made an appeal to you being a Canadian, but that's not a, a kind of scientific fact. That is an emotional state that you may have that I've now tapped into and in a sense kind of manipulated you into wearing that too because, yeah, it's still cold outside, but I've appealed to you in a different way. I haven't given you facts. I've given you sort of, you know, uh, be a true Canadian. I've, I've appealed to your your desire to be a Canadian, to act like other Canadians uh, that should be wearing toques. So it isn't based on fact, but it's based on an emotional response that you would have to a statement like that. Now, the third one is an appeal to credibility. Uh, not as strong as logos, but sort of of the two, that's one that is just as powerful, depends on what the credibility source is. But again, the problem here is uh, it can be used by advertisers in a whole range of different ways. So an appeal to credibility or ethos, the honesty or credibility of whether it's a scientist, which could be valid, that could be bordering a logos. But what about just a celebrity or a sports figure? Um, 
if you want to go for, you know, a degree of credibility that is factual, Stats Canada is very good. You could use that even in a, let's say in a public service announcement about uh, drunk driving or cigarette smoking or whatever. But when you're using a celebrity or sports figure, yeah, they have a certain degree of credibility, maybe in the sports world or in the entertainment world. But what you're doing is trying to import that credibility into something else. So you have them hawking, you know, watches and champagne and, you know, expensive cars or, or skip the dishes or whatever. If <laughs> everyone watched on the Super Bowl yesterday, those sports figures or celebrities are just that. But there is an appeal to them somehow, you know, endorsing that product. An endorsement is really what you're looking for. So credibility, right, must be established through that careful use of properly cited and relevant sources. Whether or not John Hamm can, you know, use skip the dishes is irrelevant. He's just an actor, maybe an actor I like, uh, maybe more willing to consider what he's he's selling to me. But that's all that they are. So the credibility that that person has in one field does not always translate well into another field. And that's what we have to be careful of, because that degree of credibility may fall apart as soon as we try to do exactly that. So they may be an expert in one field, but it does not make them experts in watchmaking or champagne making or anything else. So again, uh, the same statement, it's minus 30 out there. Be a true Canadian, don't freeze to death. And here's another one. Dr. David Suzuki states in the essay, Canadian winters can be dangerous, that exposure of skin to extremely low temperatures without proper winter clothing may lead to hyperthermia and frostbite. Okay, I knew that all along, but hey, David uh, Suzuki's saying that, and he's been around since uh, as far as I've been on the earth. Um, chances are it makes sense. He is a credible individual. If it was, uh, oh, I don't know, Justin Bieber or you know, The Weeknd telling me to, to bundle up, you know what? I might still listen because they're, they too live in Canada. But if somebody from California told me to wear a toque, I go, yeah, whatever. So the point here is that this is a credible individual. So the appeals to credibility are logical. They're reasonable. But having someone selling you a product simply because they happen to be, you know, able to throw a football, that's not as important, right? The credibility is belongs somewhere else. So the most effective arguments are those that appeal to logic and to credibility or to logos and to ethos. But what is typically the case in advertising, uh, advertising, sorry, and most, most recently over the last few years in political advertising and political positioning is emotional appeal to pathos. And so when you're doing that, you are literally manipulating people. And that, that goes for advertising as much as it does for political statements. You are manipulating people. You're pushing their buttons in one way or another. And when you do that and you're pushing those emotional buttons, critical reasoning and logic go out the window because you, you cannot have both of them at the same time. It's one or the other. So if that's the case, depending on how you want to be considered an ethical or legitimate writer, sure, you could use pathos all day long and people will recognize it for what it is and knock down your argument very quickly because it isn't based on common sense. It isn't based on logic. It's simply based on your, you know, distorted subjective view of the world. So if you are going to use emotional appeals, use them very, very carefully and very sparingly, but try as much as possible to build your argument on logos or ethos. Both of those are credible. So once you've made your argument, uh, argumentative claim, you have to start to build uh, that argument using those facts. And if that's the case, you're more likely to appeal to logos and ethos really than to anything else because you're trying to use reason. Now, um, this is probably a good example. Uh, normally in class, uh, right after this slide, I will do the, or I would do the in class uh, test. But when we meet on uh, Thursday, I'll go through it and you can do it at home. It's kind of fun. Um, so as we talked about ethos, pathos, and logos. So, uh, ethos, a form of argument based on character, or authority, authority figures in whatever field. Um, and the worst is endorsements by celebrities. Uh, some of these people don't even use the products, but hey, money is money, right? And so they will say, well, I'll endorse just about anything. So that's uh, an endorsement based on a particular celebrity or character, ethos. Pathos 
is one that is uh, basing it on emotions, fear, desire, sympathy, anger, any of those kinds. Um, this is this is typically uh, the manipulative aspect of advertising, right? Uh, get this or else, you know, like you need to be in the in crowd and everybody else is using this product. Uh, so it builds up a desire to belong, right? You know, well, if everybody else is watching this show or buying this product, well, I should too. So that's where you uh, you really sort of stop thinking critically. You know, is this really a good product just because so-and-so is telling me that it is, right? Ethos. Well, maybe I should start thinking about it first. You know, do I need to put all my money in this kind of thing? Um, we want as much as possible to go to the third one, logos. That's an argument based on logic, scientific facts, verifiable facts, figures, statistics, and so on. Anything, any advertisement or any any statement that uses facts, percentages, uh, information, charts and graphs and figures, it's more likely, and especially if these are done and they uh, there's a place where you can look that information up. Uh, lots of things that appear on Facebook rarely have that. So you look at it and go, what? You know, this is going on? Well, where can I find find this information? And sure enough, nowhere. No website, no no click here. Um, you want to be able to do that. If you, use, you're, if you are using charts and graphs, identify where it's from. Because if you can't or if you don't, that is itself unethical. Okay, so uh, again, in class, we're going to be doing the pictures and then come back to our, our uh, argumentative essay. So as we are working through our material, <coughs> we're thinking about that verifiable evidence. And we want to make sure that our argumentation is good because we can have both concrete uh, evidence that backs up abstract concepts. So we have a most a kind of a practical aspect and then a more conceptual aspect to our, our, our essay. So whatever kind of abstract concepts you may have, make sure to back them up with evidence. Uh, because if you don't, again, the idea remains abstract, right? It's just an idea. And the question becomes, well, why should I buy into it? What is it about this idea that, you know, warrants me changing my mind or changing my behavior? What is it about it that I should even be considering? So where can you find concrete evidence to support your claim? Well, there's there's a range of different places. Now, um, the most the, the most typical one, the one that's, uh, you know, closest at hand would be either personal evidence or experience of yourself or someone else that you know and trust. Uh, this would be first person accounts. This would be speaking to someone that actually witnessed something rather than what well, I talked to a friend who, of a friend of, you know, no, now it's been basically rewritten so many times that what that person eventually tells you probably has no, no bearing in reality. Uh, so personal evidence or experience that you yourself have experienced or that you, that you know someone else that you trust has experienced. That's one way. Now, another way, uh, this is also uh, another way to, to find out uh, opinions about people, right? I use opinions in that sense of the word. Uh, you could do primary research. You could interview people. You could start collecting statistical analysis. You can actually start doing your own research. And typically, when you do your own research, that's called primary uh, resources. You have gone out and collected the data. You haven't found it somewhere else. You collected that information through interviews, um, through whether they're written or, or spoken, whatever, but you have created the material that you then used as the basis for your argument. So that's called primary research. The other one is what most students do because uh, none of us really have the kind of time to set up interviews, follow through with them. I mean, some of these things might take several months and you might have two weeks to do the whole presentation. So the likelihood of using primary research sources in school not that likely, but what is more likely is secondary research. So these would be peer reviewed articles and books that someone else has done the research. So now, because they are peer reviewed, uh, they are valid, they are useful, and really, let's face it, you're standing on the shoulders of giants. You are using the work that someone else who themselves were peer reviewed by like minded people in the same field, and all of them said, yes, this is valid. So you came up with, you know, an idea about something and you kind of thought about it for a couple of days and go, OK, this is what I want to find out. So you start to dig around in secondary sources and lo and behold, there they are. 
here are other people who are experts and you know that have the wisdom and experience of whatever that information is that you look for but they agree with you of course you're going to use that material so secondary research sources are super useful and they're valuable for supporting your own idea even if it began as an opinion it moves from opinion to inference to fact because others are saying the same thing so secondary sources are, are always very very useful now, just to get back for a moment to primary primary research, I'm not going to spend too much time on this because uh, it's the kind of thing that, uh, I mean, I was lucky enough to spend, well, it took me about nine months to write a book and I had a lot of uh, information that I could use. Uh, these would be, you know, books and articles written by the people that I'm writing about and then I put it all together. So I, I kind of did primary research, but certainly I availed myself of secondary sources as well. Now, uh, First-hand accounts and interviews, like I mentioned, you could go through diaries and blogs. You could go through legal documents, government documents. You can start reading through newspapers and magazine features. You could watch newscasts and documentary footage, a whole range of things. All of those are primary research. Now, lab results are not secondary research. I mean, they are indirectly because someone else has done it, but they could be your lab results. So think about it. Uh, it could be newspaper articles that you have found. Uh, because you didn't find it quoted somewhere else. That's what makes it different from secondary. You found that article and that article helped your position. So first-hand accounts and interviews, diaries and blogs, legal and government documents, newspaper articles, uh, your own lab results, all of those are pri primary. Now, secondary ones, these should sound much more uh, f uh, familiar. Uh, the very least, top of the list, right? We're talking about experts right? Ethos, expert opinions, those are important. Uh, literary criticism, fire prevention, fire safety, probably not. Maybe history books, if you're looking at um, the tendency of fires to occur in certain places or forest fires as, as, as they have gotten worse over the last, say, 30 or 40 years, you might want to look at a history book. <coughs> Excuse me. So that would be very useful. Uh, academic essays, definitely. Uh, you might avail yourself of biographies. They may be helpful depending on what exactly you're writing about. But certainly in your field, expert opinions, history books, academic essays, lab reports for sure, peer-reviewed journal articles, and scientific essays. All of those are excellent secondary sources because many of those scientific essays are also peer-reviewed. So it isn't just journal articles. So all of those, uh, those sources helped to make your argument stronger and better. Now, the last thing I want to look at uh, are logical fallacies. And these are fallacies that some people use uh, deliberately and hope that no one catches them, or we can use them mistakenly when we don't realize what we're doing. So we're going to kind of break it down and say, okay, first of all, let's identify what that is. So a fallacy, right, an error or a, a, a falsity in judgment, kind of another way to look at it, Logical fallacies are errors in reasoning, again, mistaken or deliberate. Some people use them deliberately because they understand how they work. But ultimately what happens is once they are identified, they kind of weaken the, the core argument that you're trying to make. Because you have attacked the person rather than the idea, it's, it's unethical. So your position now is just slightly watered down or is maybe on looser ground than you thought because you've been busy attacking the person who expressed the idea rather than the idea itself. And that's normally in an argument, you're talking about ideas. It's not a personal attack. It's an attack on a, on a, on a position, on an idea. So those errors in judgment uh, will weaken the strength of your argument. So you don't want to do those. And if you do, you better be really, really careful how you use them. So typically they are Again, fallacies. There are things you should avoid using, but at least be able to identify them. So if you do find out you're using them, correct them right away. So it's dishonest, right? It's a dishonest tactic that is still used by many people that at the very least want to push your buttons. And that's typically what's happening these days. Everybody's buttons are getting pushed for emotional reasons. And it doesn't matter what it's about. It becomes especially bad during election years which it just seems these days we have an election every 20 minutes. So you constantly see these things coming up. So let's take a look at what some of these logical fallacies are. 
Okay, so this one is uh, a little bit like pathos. Uh, this is an appeal to strong emotion, belief, or prejudice. So uh, the problem with this, as I write here, basing it on emotions and prejudice will go against a decision that should instead be based on logic and reason, because you can't have it both ways. You're either going to appeal emotionally to someone or logically to someone. So support for one cause or point of view will blind someone to an, an alternative because you're saying, no, only do this. And any other opinions are wrong. Well, that's propaganda. Propaganda is one simple message repeated over and over again and a blockage of the blockage of any other alternative that could also be positive. And if there is even an awareness of another position, it's knocked down immediately. So uh, appeals to prejudice also are politically dangerous because there are people that are gullible that way because of a lack of education or a lack of critical thinking. So when you appeal to emotion and belief or prejudice, uh, you're playing with fire because you are pushing their emotional but, uh, uh, buttons, their, their prejudicial buttons, which border on racism and sexism. And when you start doing that, your argument could become very volatile. The other one, and we talked about this uh, in ethics, is the proverbial slippery slope. Um, anybody that is using that interprets one single event as setting off, you know, a series of other increasingly horrible things, when in fact, there's no proof, right? There's no correlation. We don't know whether one thing is going to lead to a disastrous, worse result. Um, no, that's a slippery slope. Uh, and the reason why we're, we call it that is because the result that of the next event, there's no causal relationship. It's simply someone saying that. So we say that this one event, uh, whatever it may be, is going to lead to something far worse. And there are people who think this way, when in fact, that's not the case. There is no causal relationship between the first event or any number of other events. And first of all, too, they haven't occurred. Um, another one is called ad hominem, uh, that is Latin to, uh, for attack on a person. And so if you're attacking the person, and I mentioned this just a moment ago, you're attacking them rather than the idea. So even if the person that is making this inconsistent argument, uh, is speaking, you know, their truth to power and whatever else, um, you attack the idea regardless. You want to listen to the argument and not attack them as a person, their credibility, uh, their background. That's not what it's about. It's the argument itself. It's the idea. So if you attack the person, that's called an ad hominem argument. So you don't want to be doing those unless that's what you want to do. But if you are, you're then back to pushing emotional buttons. Uh, there's also the loaded question, the kind of question that is really difficult to answer one way or the other. Uh, and it's loaded in the sense that it's, if you try to answer yes, you're going to look bad. If you answer no, you might look only slightly less bad. Um, it's, I don't have an example right now, but there are a variety of different ways you could, you could pose a question where yes or no, it's still not going to make you look very good. And some people are very clever at formulating a question that will create that. And what does that do? It becomes an attack on the person because the person really cannot answer yes or no either way. And when you listen to reporters uh, ask a load of questions, what is remarkable is listening to politicians kind of dance around the answer and they don't say yes or no. They somehow talk about the weather or something else and somehow still appear to kind of answer the question. So that's training. That's training by politicians on how to answer loaded questions because they know that no matter what they say, whether they answer yes or no, it's going to not present them in any really uh, significantly good light. Now, another one, uh, the straw man argument. Now, why it's called that, I don't know. But what it means is oversimplifying the opponent's position. Uh, the opponent's position may have a, a series of complex interrelated ideas that they are trying to present. And then you turn around and just water it all down to uh, say, you know, well, it's really about this. Well, when in fact, it's the reality of the situation is as a result of a series of events, right? And those events need to be considered both in isolation and in relation to one another. That can be pretty complicated. And that is a difficult, difficult argument to present and to maintain and hold in our heads. So one of the quickest ways to knock it down is to simply 
uh, ignore all that complexity and simply go for some, you know, some either quick fix or, uh, you know, identifying simply one element in that other person's uh, argument, or at worst, you call it fake news. So we'll see how many times people start calling fake news because over the last four years, it's been a word used practically every single day. Let's see if a year from now, the word fake news is even still used. But it is over oversimplifying the opponent's position by just calling it fake news. Now, those are kind of the, the typical ones. Uh, I've got a sheet uh, that I've attached to this week's module that you can print out, and it shows a few others. Um, and that has, uh, has to do with the at-home assignment, which we're going to talk about on Thursday. Um, so to go back to logical fallacies, another one, which has nothing to do with particular images of the straw man or ad hominem, is using absolute terms. Uh, absolute terms like, are the ones that I have right here. Uh, everybody, anyone, never, none, you know, only, all. Uh, be careful with those because what you are doing is implying that, for example, absolutely no one likes to go to work. Well, there are some people that are lucky enough and humble enough to have ended up in a position that they enjoy working. They enjoy doing what they're doing. So to make a claim that nobody likes to go to work is patently false. Or only lonely people go to bars. Well, all kinds of, these days, no, nobody can go to a bar, but typically all kinds of people go to bars. They go there to celebrate birthday parties. They meet friends. They don't, they're not lonely. It's just a place to, to meet. So be careful with absolutes because you're basically shutting down any possible alternative when clearly there are alternatives. Instead, try to do something like this, what's, what are called qualifying terms. Most people hate their jobs. Not all, but most. Uh, overall, not everybody, but overall, lonely people tend to tend to go to bars, right? So you've softened the language. You've now moved away from this sort of absolute notion that only lonely people. You say overall, typically, for the most part, you know, lonely people tend to, and or the ever popular, generally speaking, you know, again, for the most part, they mean the same thing, but they soften that absolute quality. Generally speaking, cats do not like water. And of course, as soon as you see that, you click on a YouTube, you know, cat uh, videos, and one of these cats going to jump into a pool, swim around. There you go. So generally speaking, cats don't like water. Not all the time. Okay. Now, when you are writing and thinking and writing some more and revising and drafting, remember, too, that you know, people are, for the most part, again, generally speaking, are a little bit more critical of, about what they read. If you are at all aware of what the world has been like, uh, or has become, I should say, uh, over the last, let's say, four years. So it seems to be a chunk of time that will be sort of a, 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 a you know, a, a rule of thumb. Um, the last four years have seen people be increasingly uncritical because they want their positions validated. They, you know, they want to know that other people think the, the same way that they do. And that despite presenting, you know, factual evidence to them, they, they refuse to believe. And that's really the key word. It's a belief system. Those are really hard to knock down. If you truly believe that X or Y is occurring, and of course it's particularly bad in politics these days, um, there are also just as many people that are becoming more critical. They are thinking more carefully about what they are reading. And it only took to what, this year for Facebook to put a little uh, link in an article that says, you know, um, this could be questionable or click here to get more information. Too little, too late, yes, but it's better than nothing. It's at least a tiny step towards being a little bit more critical, at least finding out the facts. So if you're working on anything, ultimately think of the following three things. The first one is shared values. Most people think the earth is round or some sort of, you know, round-ish sort of shape and not flat. So shared values are really important. And the values of fairness, equality, ethics, responsibility are kind of something that writers are expected to not only be aware of, but to use, right, to share in. So the value of presenting an idea to someone, to even have the ability to, first of all, and have your work published is pretty cool. But with that comes the ability to remain fair, equal, and responsible. 
That is the least we expect of writers to be. So those shared values should be shared amongst both the readers and the writers so that we say that, look, for the most part, if I'm going to read something, I'm going to assume uh, that it is fair and equal and responsible. Secondly, presenting a fair, well-considered argument. Uh, the opposite is something that is inconclusive or one-sided. Uh, or if there is even this, the other side, the opposing side that is presented, the writer refuses to acknowledge uh, any kind of engagement with it. They simply point out that it exists and then they leave it, they, they leave it alone thinking that's it. I'm being ethical, right? I'm discussing the other side. Well, no, you're not. You're simply acknowledging that there is even another side, but not engaging with it, right? You know, being fair and equal and ultimately not being responsible. So if you are not fair and well considered in your argument, people will recognize it. And those that know better will knock down your argument very quickly because it is one sided and they recognize it as such. And then finally, and this is really important, no matter what, no matter what, in fact, this is an issue I'm facing now with my book. What is my audience? Do they know about these people I'm writing about? Do they not? I have to make a decision and whatever decision I make, I have to follow through with it. So yes, always consider your audience. So when you're writing an argument, consider that, art, that, that audience carefully. And there will be some time or another that you need to sort of stop and explain and define certain terms. Um, you want to be able to establish some kind of common ground before you start moving further and further along in the argument. Always find that commonality. Always find what, what we share together. Uh, for many years, um, at least in, in academics, we've been uh, working about identity politics and difference. And now it appears Again, generally speaking, and I'm not going to say absolutes, generally speaking, I think people are now in a mood to perhaps find some common ground. Because if we push ourselves away into identity politics and into uh, differences, we eventually forget what we share, right? And it becomes hard to build something for everyone uh, if we don't at least acknowledge that we do share a lot more than, than we think. And that ultimately, those differences are... Uh, are, you know, they can be fixed. I'm not saying they can be extinguished and ignored, but they can be acknowledged and we can reintegrate people into something that's a bit more fair, equal and responsible. So yes, always consider your audience when you're writing your argument and assess what kind of audience you wish to address, right? Do you wish to manip uh, manipulate them or do you wish to teach them? Okay, so that's it. Just a little under an hour. Uh, on Thursday, when we meet, uh, I'm going to explain to you your at-home assignment. Again, both of them are, I'd like to say they're kind of fun, but <laughs> I know right now you're going, sir, there's no such thing as a fun assignment, but they kind of are. So on Thursday, we'll talk about them in a little bit more detail. Uh, there's going to be a short at-home uh, assignment and then what would have been an in-class assignment. But regardless, I will talk about those on Thursday and uh, we'll see each other real soon. It's Monday morning, about 1030. So in a few days, we'll get back and uh, do have a look through these slides and listen. And then on Thursday, I'll give you the details of the two assignments that I wish for you to complete. So take care and we'll see you.